Good morning. How many love to see people going public with their faith? Today, there we are. We're actually beginning a year-long journey together in the Gospel of Matthew. You might know that he was one of the original 12 disciples and his occupation prior to being a follower of Jesus was a tax collector for Rome. What you might not realize is that politics were as divisive back then as they are today. So you had Matthew the tax collector and the same group of people with Simon the zealot. And when they said zealot, that wasn't a reference to how much passion he carried about. It was that he wanted to see Rome overthrown. That's what he was zealous about. And so you have two people on polar opposite ends of political scales, but what drew them together and what was more important to them was following Jesus. He actually, we're gonna find out about his interaction with Jesus and following him in chapter nine. So you might be wondering, how is he able to record chapters one through eight? It's a reasonable assumption that this is information that Jesus actually told him. Why would we wanna take a whole year to study the Gospel of Matthew. And the first reason is that it actually helps us better understand the Old Testament. Uh, Matthew gives more Old Testament references than any of the other Gospels. In fact, than all of the other Gospels combined. And there's a reason for that, and it's who he's talking to. But some people think that the Old Testament really has no value for them. Paul would write to Timothy and he would say, all scripture has been inspired by God and it's profitable. And so one of the things that happens in this study is that we will actually gain a lot more appreciation for the richness of the Old Testament. Secondly, is that Matthew is writing to provide evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. He is who he says he is. And he's actually writing to Jewish people. So you'll notice that he, he makes references to scripture and stories assuming they already are familiar with them. And so one of the things we'll do is go back and familiarize ourselves with them so we'll know what he's talking about. Um, the third thing is, is that Matthew's gospel is the most inclusive for Gentiles. Even though he is himself Jewish and he's writing to Jewish people, he actually includes Gentiles more in his gospel than any of the other gospels. And fourthly, Matthew provides more of Jesus' teaching goes in depth on how to become a missional disciple. Not just what beliefs should you think are true, but how do you live them out in a way that makes a difference in our world. So that's why we're spending a whole year in Matthew. And the first message, I have to give you a warning. If, there was, if, if this were a video uh, that you were watching on television or online, it would say for mature audiences only. You'll see. Matthew 1, beginning in the first verse, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Amminadab, Amminadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, Jesse, the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. I, I know, you, you came to to church, early service, to hear a genealogy. <laughs> uh, let me start with a question. What makes you a credible person? Why should people take you seriously? And when people don't, it affects us internally in ways it's hard to describe. In our culture, what we say is it's because of of the education that I've received. I have these degrees, therefore I should be taken seriously. Sometimes it's because of our accomplishments. This is what I have done, I should be taken seriously. Sometimes it's our experience. This is what I've been through, these are the things I've learned, therefore I should be taken seriously. In the ancient world, 
those things didn't make you a credible person. It was the family you came from, it was your genealogy. And when you think about it, it's not as crazy as it sounds because it took families hundreds and hundreds of years to establish a reputation in their community. And so if their reputation was poor, you kind of knew what you were getting into if you interacted in any way with those individuals. If the reputation was that they were fair and they were righteous and they were kind and they were generous, that generation or that reputation was gained over generations. And so you kind of knew what you were getting into. To ignore someone's family line in the ancient world was unwise. By the way, for what it's worth, when I do premarital counseling, one of the things we do is we talk quite a bit about your family of origin. Why is that? Because there are things you learned in the family you were raised up with that you're going to expect or that you're going to reenact. And if that's what you want, that's great. If it's not what you want, there's work to do. We're influenced by the families that we come from. So there are three names that are significant in the genealogy, and I didn't read all of them, but the three names are Abraham and David and then uh, Jesus. And uh, this lineology is, is not intended to, to be an exhaustive list. There's actually cases where as much as 700 years goes by and a name is not listed out of that period of time. Uh, the reason that, that Matthew is choosing these names is a story that he wants to tell. Uh, how many know uh, you have some family members that when people ask you who your family is, you leave their names out? <laughs> you just, and, and they say, oh, is that your brother? Oh, yeah, 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 he's my, he's my brother. It doesn't come up right away. Uh, Abraham, David, and Jesus, because Abraham is the one who God promised from your family, the whole world will be blessed. David established a kingdom that began a rule in the way that God intended it to be. But in the exile, God's people were, dis were scattered all over the globe and the kingdom was destroyed. And what Matthew is saying is in Jesus, the people are called back to be a people of promise and God's kingdom is reestablished. It's a very powerful thing. What's interesting in genealogies, especially in the ancient world, is that there's something that's never listed among them, and that is the names of women. Women were left out of genealogy. They didn't track uh, lineage through women. And the reason they left them out had a lot to do with the culture. It wasn't a biblical command in any sort. But what you probably noticed is that there were four names of women listed in this genealogy. So any Jewish reader in the first century would have looked at that and thought it incredibly strange. Why does he include women in his genealogy? Matthew makes a powerful point. God's kingdom breaks down barriers. God's kingdom breaks down barriers. When you look at these women, you're actually going to find out that none of them are Jewish. Three of them are scandalous. There are barriers that God is breaking down. Barriers of ethnicity, barriers of, of, of who's considered good and who's considered bad, barriers between men and women. That's a very powerful way to start. God's new kingdom is going to be inclusive rather than exclusive. Now, even today, that's provocative language. When I said it, there are some people in this room who go, I'm not sure. I think, he's, I think the pastor's being influenced by, by something else. I'm being influenced by Matthew chapter 1. So we look at this, and, and Matthew's establishing the credibility of Jesus. But he's also preaching the gospel of Jesus. He's showing us in this genealogy that moral outsiders and ethnic outsiders have found a way to be included in the family of God. He could have chosen women like Sarah and Rachel and Rebecca and Leah. They're all stalwarts, uh, uh, examples in the Old Testament of women who lived out their faith in very positive ways. But he doesn't. He chooses something else. Why is he doing that? He's telling us something about this new kingdom. He's telling us something about this new king. Jesus will drive out evil in the present world, but Jesus also has the capacity to drive out evil in the past and in the future. 
He's not saying that God approves of certain behaviors. What he's saying is that God can redeem and restore and renew people who have struggled with certain behaviors. How many think that's good news? Yeah, it is. So the genealogy of Jesus reveals that, that God is Lord over the past, the present, and the future. So there's four women. We're going to briefly go into their stories. This is where it gets to mature rating. The first woman is Tamar. You can find her story in Genesis chapter 38. She married a guy named Ur. I'm not making that up. That was his name. And uh, the, he was the eldest son of Judah. And uh, he was a wicked man, and he died. And in the custom of that day was, if this woman had no sons, she would become the next brother's wife, even if he had a wife, so that the lineage of the first son could continue on. And so she became the, the wife of the second brother. His name is Onan. And Onan decided he wanted to enjoy the sexual union with this woman, but he didn't want to have any children by her because he didn't want his inheritance to be divided in any way. This is how the Bible actually describes it. Whenever he slept with his brother's widow, he spilled his semen on the ground so that he wouldn't produce a child for his brother. God was much offended by what he did. So he died. She was given to the third brother. Uh, his name is Shelah. And uh, Sheila was too young to get married. And so Judah says, let's, uh, let's, let's put a pause on this. He's not old enough to get married. Why don't you go back home, live with your parents as a widow, and then when he's old enough, we'll make the arrangements. Well, he got old enough, but no arrangements were made. And so uh, uh, Tamar heard that Judah was going down to a city to shear sheep. They didn't have just a few sheep, they had whole herds, and this was quite a project. It involved a lot of work, and there were places you would go to do it. And actually, Judah was probably more overseeing the process than actually engaged in it. But she heard that he was going, and so she took off her widow's clothes, and she put on the clothes of a prostitute. I know what you're thinking. You said, I didn't know that story was in the Bible. People who think the Bible is boring haven't read it. <laughs> she puts on the clothes of the prostitute and goes to a place that she knows Judah is going to pass by. And when he does, he doesn't recognize who she is because one of the things prostitutes would do is put veils over their faces. And so he doesn't recognize her. He solicits her. He wants to know how much it's going to cost. The answer is a goat. He doesn't have a goat with him. She wants to know what security he's going to leave. He says, what do you want? She says, I'll take your seal, your cord that holds the seal, and your walking stick. So he leaves that behind. They go through their, their exchange, and he goes back home. He sends somebody back with the goat. When they get there, they can't find her. They go around and ask, where's the, the temple prostitute that usually stays here? And they said, there's no temple prostitute in this town. We don't know what you're talking about. He goes back and tells Judah, and Judah says, well, then I, I don't want us to keep going back looking for her. We'll become a laughing stock in the city, so just forget that. What she has, she can keep. Three months later, Judah hears that his former daughter-in-law is pregnant. And he orders her execution by burning her to death for her infidelity. And she sends a messenger to Judah. The father of my child is the guy who owns this seal, this cord, and this walking stick. Judah sees those things, and these are the words he says, she is more righteous than I. He stays the execution, and that child, she actually gives birth to twins. One of those children are included in the family of Jesus. It's astonishing. God takes a woman who was only used for sexual pleasure with no commitment to her or her future, and he writes her into his story. Second woman, Rahab. I'm sorry, this story doesn't get any better. Before Israel took possession, by the way, you can find her story in Joshua chapter two, before Israel took possession of the promised land, Rahab was a prostitute in the city of Jericho. 
Joshua had sent two spies into the city to find out how strong the city was and what the, their capacity was militarily. And the spies went to Rahab's house. It would not be uncommon for men to enter or leave a place like that. Uh, the security forces heard that men that were not recognized had gone in there and they came to find them. They were concerned that these were actually spies from Israel. She hid them under flax that was drying on the roof of the house and then later she allowed them to escape out of a window. The way her house was situated is that her house was built into the city wall and so they were able to escape and, and their lives were spared. Why did she do it? And she tells the, the two spies why. She says, I've heard of your God and I've heard how he brought great freedom to all of the Israelites who were enslaved in what he did at the Red Sea. And she says, I know that you're going to be victorious here. I want you to remember my family when you take control of this city. And they exchanged a promise with her that her family would be spared. A woman who was trafficked and seemingly had no options was rescued and her life was redeemed and her child was written into the story of God's family. Uh, Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. There's a whole book written about her. Uh, as a Moabite, she was actually prohibited by Old Testament command of ever drawing near or entering into anything that had to do with religious worship in the land of Israel. How that story came to be was there was a man named uh, Elemech who um, he left Israel because of a famine and he went to Moab looking for opportunities to survive and thrive in some kind of business. He married a woman named Naomi and while there had two sons, uh, Elemech actually died and his two sons married women in Moab. One of them was Ruth. Both of those sons died. And uh, Naomi encouraged her, her young uh, widows that were daughters-in-law uh, to go back to their homes and try to start their life over again. But Ruth actually looked at Naomi and, and what she said is, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. You've probably heard this in weddings because it's often used there. This is what she says to her mother-in-law, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. That's the origin of that line. Uh, Naomi decides to go back into Israel because things have improved there. And Israel has an interesting strategy for help caring for the poor. I, I don't know if you're aware of this. It was an agrarian society and so how they would help to take care of the poor is if you owned a field and you were, it was harvest time and this was, it was actually during this time it was the time of uh, uh, barley harvest. The owners of the field were not allowed to, to harvest the corners of the field. And their workers, if they were carrying the harvest, anything they dropped, they were not allowed to pick up. The poor would come to the fields and they would harvest the corners and they would follow all the laborers and anything that they dropped, they would pick up. And that's how the poor were cared for in the ancient world in Israel. And so Naomi had returned, or Naomi had gone to where her husband had come from, and because Ruth would not leave her, she goes with her. And what happens is, is that uh, she happens to be working in a field uh, uh, that's owned by a man by the name of Boaz, and uh, he thinks she's quite something. He's quite smitten with her. And so he tells his laborers to drop handfuls on purpose, just so she's well cared for. It's the beginning of a love story that was one of the great love stories of the Old Testament. And she winds up marrying Boaz and their child is written into the story of God's family. Ruth was a poor woman of an ethnicity that limited her options and God includes her in, her, in his family. And then Bathsheba, she's actually not named in Matthew's gospel. She's referred to as the wife of the Hittite, Uriah. Um, you're more familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba, and that was her name. Um, Uriah was one of the elite warriors of David. Uh, he was off in battle, 
David was up on his roof and he, he watched a woman who was bathing. And she was a beautiful woman. And so he sent out servants to inquire about her. And, uh, and when he found out who she was, he had the servants bring her to the palace. I don't think that you could declare what happened next as two consenting adults. Bathsheba really had no power and no choice in what would happen next. As a result of that meeting, she became pregnant. She told David about it. He immediately sent for Uriah to come back from the battle, assuming that she would spend some time, he would spend some time with his wife while he was home. And he did not. And the reason he did not is he said that my, my comrades in battle are sleeping out in the open field and their lives are at risk and it wouldn't be right for me to go home and enjoy my wife while they're fighting for their life. David didn't know what to do about that, but he came up with a plan. And the plan was, was to send Uriah back with a message, making sure that he would not survive the next battle. David not only forced himself on Bathsheba, but he made sure that her husband was killed. He arranged for her murder. Once she was dead, he had Bathsheba brought to the palace and they were married. Bathsheba was the victim of sexual assault whose husband was taken from her and impregnated by a man who could get whatever he wanted. And God wrote her into his story. Matthew's not just about recounting history, he's preaching the gospel. It's absolutely astonishing. God's not approving someone's behavior. He's rescuing people. He's redeeming people. He's restoring people to his intended purpose. Though they did not think it possible, God worked them into his plan of redemption for our world. God is not just recounting history, H-I-S-T-O-R-Y. He's recounting his story, H-I-S-S-T-O-R-Y, and he is including us in it. How many are glad you're included? and God's story in our world. Yes? So beginning in verse 18, Matthew is going to reveal something that's interesting. He goes through all this genealogy and then he says, Joseph is not the father. <laughs> that this baby that Mary is carrying actually has a supernatural origin. So why go through all of this genealogy if Joseph is not the father? And the answer is, in ancient Israel, adoption was considered as much a work of God as natural birth. They considered it a work of God when God would knit together the genetic code of a child inside the womb of a woman, and they considered it just as much a work of God when God arranged and knit together the strands of individuals and events to bring a child into a family that they would be adopted. How many are glad that God has such a high view of adoption? Isn't that great? Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. The darkest moments of our lives actually can wind up being our greatest witness. The part of our story that embarrasses us might be the part that actually rescues somebody else. The part we hide and prefer not, not to talk about might be the part of our story that actually shines light into someone else's life about what God could do for them. God has rescued each and every one of us from something. I know we don't like to think about it. We sure don't like to talk about it. Mostly these are painful and embarrassing experiences where we made humiliating choices or we suffered at the choices of others. We'd much prefer to remember who we are becoming than to think about who we have been. But Matthew chapter one tells us a very powerful truth. What if God wanted to use your story to redeem another person who's struggling? Would you be willing to share how your marriage that was shattered got put back together? Would you be willing to share how your addiction to something like pornography devastated your life 
and how God brought you to a place of freedom. Would you be willing to share your journey towards sobriety? Would you be willing to share how you found hope in the midst of deep depression? It is worth revealing how bad things were to show how good God is. If we're going to accomplish our mission in our world of reaching lost people, it's not going to be by proving to them how good we are. It's going to be by proving to them how good God is and what he has rescued us from. How many are glad we have a God who has rescued you and restored you and redeemed you? So would you bow your heads? Are you willing to tell your story? There are lives that may well depend on it. You too have been written into the story of Jesus and like four women who probably would not have appreciated much attention. Their story gave hope to so many others about what God could do with them in their lives. So Father, help us this morning. Help us remember how good you are, how great your grace is, how much you can do when we dare to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.